volcanoes have terrified and fascinated people since the dawn of time. Their eruptions are a beautiful but lethal natural phenomenon. The Kamchatka Peninsula is in eastern Russia. This region has been called the land of stone torches and for good reason. There are few places on the planet where you can see so many different volcanoes. Constantly in turmoil, Kamchatka's landscape continues to be molded with each century of volatile activity under the ground. At Kamchatka, a climb up a volcano usually begins at a dirt track. This is a military off-road truck fitted with a wagon to transport people. Driver Yevgeny Kaklinch uses it to bring tourists to the foot of the thousand-year-old Plosky Talbachik volcano several times a month. People only recently started going up from that side. They only used to hunt there before the eruption. These people are just everyday tourists. For their travel routes, they chose the places where you don't need special mountaineering skills. They've each made at least one trip to the mountains, but none has ever been near the site of the so-called major fissile eruption of Tolbachik. Many years ago, Lava fountains burst from cracks in the ground near the center of the ancient volcano Plosky Talbachik. It takes a while to get to the epicenter of the eruption. The start of the ascent is a five hour cross country drive from the nearest settlement. Several dozen kilometers away from where the lava broke through the surface, the dead forest begins. White, dry tree trunks dot the black volcanic slag. It's all a reminder of the destructive forces which volcanoes possess. Every tourist group is sure to make a quick stop here. From this point, the aim of their extreme hike is already visible. The twin stratified volcanoes, Ostri and Plosky Talbachik, sit on the horizon, covered with fog. There are several low-rising new volcanic cones nearby. Ash and slag from these craters have covered several kilometers of the surrounding area. You're looking at the top of a tree. It's actually just a small part of it. This tree is completely buried 20 meters down, just like all the others. Few know about it, but the depth of slag, which is the rock that we are standing on, can be up to 60 meters. A bit to the left, we can see a normal tree that hasn't been buried under so much slag. On the 6th of July, 1975, fountains of lava began bursting from cracks in the crust 18 kilometers from the extinct crater of the Plosky Talbachik volcano, destroying everything in their way. Geophysicist Pavel Tokarev had predicted the exact place, date, and even time of that mighty eruption. Staff at the Kamchatka Institute of Volcanology, the only one in the world at that time, were ready. They even managed to fully research and film it. In this picture, young volcanologist Alexander Avsyanikov is researching the massive eruption of Tolbachik. He was there two weeks after the eruption started. The scene was just overwhelming. At the time, bolts of lightning were crashing down. It was tremendous indeed. A cloud of ash stretched for one and a half thousand kilometers. 
and fell into the ocean. It looked as if the lightning was flying across that cloud and striking into the volcano's cone. Boy, did it make a terrible racket. The biggest concentration of volcanoes is situated on the Pacific coast. 328 of them are active and form the Pacific Ring of Fire. Kamchatka is part of it. There are 29 volcanoes on the eastern coast of the peninsula. This peninsula has many volcanoes, as the subduction zone is located here. The oceanic plate is moving beneath the continental plate and gradually sliding inside. Naturally, the friction causes frequent earthquakes. Large in situ cracks and so-called weakened zones occur allowing the magma to come up to the surface. The locals call this mud pot sculptor, a zone where one of the Earth's plates slides under another, which is known as subduction, is located deep below the mud pot. The magma melts mountain rocks, forming gas. On its way upwards, it heats water, mixes it with earth, and throws it out in the form of liquid clay. The sculptor is just one of the many fantastical features to be found in one of the world's oldest volcano calderas. It's located in the central part of Kamchatka's eastern volcanic belt. This gigantic crater cauldron is the caldera of the Uzon volcano. About 300,000 years ago, a three kilometer high composite cone used to tower over a place of the present Uzon volcano. This stratovolcano crumbled after a series of powerful eruptions. The earth below the volcano gave under, forming a caldera. The average height of its cliffs is 400 meters, and the diameter is more than 12 kilometers. The Uzon caldera features unusual manifestations of modern volcanic activity. There are hundreds of boiling and bubbling whirlpools and mud pools here, small volcanic cones, hot lakes, and areas with steam, gas, and hot water jets breaking through the ground. All the hot lakes of the Uzon caldera are hostile to any advanced life forms, but they are populated by special types of algae which produce oxygen, making the water's surface bubble. At the same time, they prevent methane and carbon dioxide from the underground waters from breaking the surface and rising into the atmosphere. There are very specific conditions of soil and water here. One can find many types of bacteria with the absolutely different structures. This is interesting, of course. Uzon is a specially protected site within the Kronotsky Nature Reserve. Yevgeny Vlasov lives and works here, monitoring the caldera. During the summer, he accompanies excursions to protect tourists from the local bears. The bear trail goes north and reaches Lake Dalnia. This crater, filled with cold, clear water, is known as a ma. This one is about a kilometer in diameter. Its inner cliffs are quite steep, so there's barely any shoreline around the lake. Just a narrow black ring of ash, volcanic bombs, or masses of molten rock and scoria. Here's a piece of volcanic glass I found by the lake. It's very sharp. It's just the kind of thing that ancient people used to scrape animal skins with before iron and steel were invented. It's very sharp and very hard. This is a piece of hardened lava. The last time it was unerupted was 40,000 years ago. This time hasn't been long enough for grass to cover the lava. 40,000 years is an ancient history. This group of tourists is exploring a new chapter in the history of Kamchatka's eruptions. One of their plans is to conquer two volcano cones near Plosky Talbachik. The unspoken rules of climbing volcanoes are quite simple. Follow your guide closely, 
don't stretch the chain. If you cannot walk any further, everyone else descends along with you. Their aim is to reach the summit of the cone not far from the ancient volcano. We're about to start a difficult ascent. Don't walk too far from me, follow in each other's steps. Beware of sharp rocks that may slip from under your feet and cause serious injuries. In some instances, rocks have fallen from the slope above and hit people on the head. On occasion, the injuries have even been fatal. Each cone is about 1,500 meters above sea level. These are the so-called new Talbachic volcanoes. They appeared as a result of the eruption in 1975. Here was one of its four epicenters. From one of the cone tops, there's a good view of the crater and broad canals of thick, spurting lava. Those were the liquid types of lava spurts. They covered more than 30 square kilometers. The forest was destroyed as well as the entire beautiful tundra that had been there. Three weeks after the eruption, one of the cones suddenly threw out a massive amount of lava. It traveled upwards from a depth of 30 kilometers. Scientists say some three billion tons of erupted material in the form of rocks came from below the surface. All the while, the molten pieces of lava, known as volcanic bombs, shot out from ruptures. Scientists had to carry out their research in extreme conditions. We were working right below the cones. As we were selecting stones and chopping samples off hot rocks, at times those volcanic bombs would land on us. They were falling from above like cannon shots, and we would look up and end up dodging all over the place to avoid them. Today, years after the eruption, the tallest and widest wall of the volcano's crater is a reminder of what was left since the lava streams broke out. The banks of these thickened rivers are painted in different hues. During the eruption, rocks with a high concentration of copper, sulfur and other elements appear. Each has a unique color of its own. The top of the cone is very hot. The warmth is still rising from the depths of the earth. We've brought these sticks here to set them on fire with the internal heat of this cone. The temperature inside the fissure is 900 degrees, so the stick catches fire in a matter of seconds. The first climb ends at sunset on the first day of the mountain trip. But there is a much longer, more difficult, and interesting way to the summit of Plosky Talbachik's volcanic crater tomorrow. The landscape, which includes the Austri and Plosky Talbachik volcanoes, looks more like the surface of the moon. Thick lava streams, high rising cones, half destroyed craters, small funnels, huge slag wastes and fields of volcanic bombs. These are the results of numerous eruptions. Of course, one can easily imagine that this landscape isn't part of the Earth, even if they don't know what happened on the Moon. At that time, in the mid-1960s, scientists had photos of the lunar surface. Therefore, Kamchatka was chosen as one of the testing areas for the first Soviet-made lunar rover. Perhaps there really wasn't a better place on the planet for testing that equipment. Volcanic slag is almost identical to the hard, sandy surface of the Moon. 
Just like there, the area has no bogs, forests or grass. But what it does have are numerous hills and hurdles. The first moon rover, called Lunachod 1, had eight wide wheels. Their semi-spherical profile prevented the vehicle from sliding sideways when moving along a hill and increased its cross-country capacity. The so-called sudden hurdles, made of volcanic bombs, were placed in the way of the moon rover. The test was successful and the Lunachod was sent to the moon. The moon rover's test ground provides magnificent views over the two volcanoes. The snowy, almost vertical Ostri Talbacic towers 3,682 meters above sea level. Nearby, the adjacent grey edge of Plosky Talbacic can be seen. It sits at a height of 3,080 meters. The path is 15 kilometers long. Anyone who's not sure they can make it follows in the guide's wake during an uphill climb. The way they breathe tells the guide when he needs to slow down. Tourists with the greatest stamina are at the end of the group. Tourists here don't take frequent breathers, so they don't lose their tempo. From a height of 2,000 meters, the panorama of the Great Telbachic Fissure Eruption comes into view. A chain of volcanic cones stretches to the horizon. In the autumn of 1976, a new eruption occurred 10 kilometers away from where lava burst through the Earth's surface earlier that year. The Great Talbachic eruption lasted for 17 months. Mountains were formed and the terrain of a vast sector of the Kamchatka Peninsula changed. The wild animals and birds that survived in that hellish atmosphere had to rely on humans for help. The magma chamber below the ancient Plosky Talbachic volcano is now empty. In this picture, it's clear to see its crater filled with a hot lava lake. Despite the fact that Plosky Talbachic has never erupted, it's considered to be active, like the new Talbachic volcanoes. They are active volcanoes. This means they are either at the stage of eruption or they are displaying other types of action, for instance, so-called fumarole or thermal activity. Tourists flying to the famous Valley of Geysers by helicopter often see the fumarolic activities of local volcanoes. Fumaroles are ordinary steams of volcanic gas and steam. They burst out from volcanic hearths together with ash and particles of earth. The Valley of Geysers lies in the so-called zone of modern volcanism. Hundreds of years ago, lava burst out near this canyon and two volcanoes emerged during the eruption. The Valley of Geysers is between them. The magma beneath still heats up layers of rock and water streams. Thermal energy cracks the ground making curious forms of hydrothermal activity, like steam pits, potholes, or geysers, which are erupting boiling springs. Scientists have defined their activity into four stages. Hot boiling water from a water-bearing layer seeps into the geyser channel. It's then filled with boiling water, part of which begins to spill out. The geyser's rising main starts boiling. The steam bursts out. Hot water remains in the channel after the geyser's eruption, while the steam rises to the top. Kamchatka is often called the Hot Peninsula for its various forms of hydrothermal activity. This is one of the few places on the planet where unconventional power technology is implemented.
A geothermal power station is located at the foot of the Magnovsky volcano cone. The ground's natural heat is used for producing electricity. Only 60 specialists man the station. Their job is monitoring its automatic systems around the clock and fixing any malfunctions as soon as they occur. In terms of environment protection, it's a very clean production process. We take steam from below the surface and send a mixture of waste steam and water back into the earth. The hot steam is filtered from water droplets and small rock particles. The hot dry vapor gushes through at very high speed from the separator into the turbine and spins the rotor blades. This generates an electromagnetic field. The current it creates goes into this distribution unit. After all transformations, this equipment raises the electrical power produced from the geothermal steam energy up to 220 volts. Then it gets transmitted by power lines to consumers in the city. The peninsula's only major city, Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky, is situated close to two volcanoes, Avachinsky and Karaski. It was founded in 1740. Scientists here predict the possibility of an earthquake of seven or eight points on the Richter scale with devastating effect. It could be triggered by Avachinsky's sudden eruption. The Avachinsky volcano has passed the stage of forming a caldera. A gigantic explosion occurred on its top some 30,000 years ago. The western part of Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky stands on deposits left over by the blast on Avachinsky. Good evening, you're listening to the Simple Rules program on Radio Kamchatka. Today we are going to tell you how to prepare for natural disasters and stay alive. Now we are going to name just three simple rules, which are always easy to fulfill. The most important thing is to do it on time. Select the quickest exit from the building in advance. Define safe areas at home and teach children and relatives to occupy them if necessary. And finally, keep all your documents together and an emergency bag with medicine, water and warm things in an accessible place. It's scary living here, really scary. We always have our emergency bag ready. It hangs in the corridor. The bag contains our documents, children's papers and the most essential things. I still remember how we used to pack an emergency bag with documents and warm things. But my child doesn't know about it. We don't do this anymore. We've got used to it by now. Moreover, the foreign tourists come here, they like it. Volcanoes. It's good that they exist. It would have been worse if there hadn't been any volcanoes. In fact, volcanoes are great cleaners. They burn out all the negative energy reproduced by people. It takes about five hours for trained tourists to climb the crater of the Plosky Talbachik volcano. When nearing the summit, you have to walk several kilometers along a steep, sharp range. This is the hardest part of the ascent but the desire to see the crater drives people to walk onwards and upwards. At a height of 3,080 meters, the feeling of tiredness is beaten by the sight of the magnificent millennium-old volcano. This hot journey was worth it. I'm now sitting on the brink of the crater and I'm looking at all this beauty and thinking that I'm the only person in the world who at this very moment is lucky enough to play the flute at a height of 3,000 meters. Everyone has their own answer as to why volcanoes attract people. Some try to overcome their fear and prove that they can withstand this challenge. Many enjoy an extreme trip. 
Others are simply curious and are brave enough to look inside one of nature's biggest and most destructive wonders.